Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this session on advanced principles. My name is Tin and I will be um, giving this session uh, today. Mm, so I, the way I imagine this is it doesn't last longer than an hour, maybe an you know, hour 15 tops. Uh, so it doesn't become too tiring for everyone. What I'm going to cover is first of all, how to make a principle argument. Secondly, how to weigh principles. Thirdly, how to strategically utilize them. And fourthly, how do you deal with them? So how do you respond to principles? Uh, in terms of questions, uh, I would like questions to be given during the lecture. So, of course, I will ask at the end whether there are any questions where it pops into your mind. During the lecture, just immediately put it in the chat or just DM me on Zoom because uh, I will be watching the chat and I will try to integrate it into the session immediately. I think the best, this is the best way because when you have a Q&A at the end, it just I think a lot of people's attention spans a drop or people have to go. And I think this is just a more dynamic way to immediately answer people's questions and you know, just integrate it into what I'm talking about. Um, that being said, I would like to start. So the first thing we have to discuss is how to make a principal argument, how to make it well. So there are a couple of parts. There are a couple of steps that you need to follow in order for this to work well. I'm going to go over each and every one of them and explain what I mean by this and try to give examples as much as possible in order for this to be as clear as possible. So the first thing that one needs to keep in mind when making a principal argument, and this is something that people very often forget and that people very often just do not do, is that you need to have a theoretical definition of the principle before you start to argue why a certain principle is or is not being fulfilled within the motion. So in other words, what is the principle in question and how is it measured? We give a couple of examples. So if you are, let's say, debating about progressive taxation and you want to make a principled argument that you think that progressive taxation is a fair distribution of wealth, my first question is, what is a fair distribution of wealth in general? What type of wealth distribution should be considered fair? And what are the criteria for any wealth distribution to be considered fair, and only then can you argue why progressive taxation fulfills this. Secondly, if you want to argue that within the criminal justice system, for example, a decision is a just decision, what is a just decision? Or if you want to say that something fulfills the role of the criminal justice system, what is the role of the criminal justice system? So is it retribution, is it rehabilitation? To what extent is it one or the other? And only then you can compare uh, only then you can compare whether or not something is the role of the justice system or not the role of the justice system. I think another example to just give a particular motion is when you have the idea, this house supports the use of eco-terrorism uh, in order to combat climate change, whereby eco-terrorism would be uh, sabotaging, let's say, nuclear plants or sabotaging or attacking individuals, or for example, CEOs of certain corporations. And you would want to argue for the principle of self-defense. So this is a legitimate act of self-defense. The first question is, what are the criteria for something to be considered a legitimate act of self-defense? The criteria would probably be, one, it's proportional. So if, I, you know, if I'm attacked by someone and they have a knife, it's proportional for me to hit them or to try to disarm them. If I disarm them and they're lying on the floor and they're obviously unconscious, it would be disproportional for me to then take that knife and you know, plunge it into their heart because I've already defended myself. There is no need for additional action. The second would probably be that there is no other way out. So that there is no alternative in which you avoid harms. So if I can, in this case of eco-terrorism, if there are other ways to fight climate change that would not incur harms upon property and people, we should probably prioritize those. And from government, you would then want to show but this is the only way that all lobbying has failed, that you know all legislation has failed, and this is the this is the only way. The third one, I think, will probably be intent. So whether or not your intent is truly to defend yourself and defend others, or you have malicious intent, because in the justice system we take that intent into account. So you would want to prove that from the perception of the individuals committing these acts, they feel like they have no other choice, and they feel that the only way to defend themselves and to defend others is to do this. So they have no malicious intent, therefore we consider this self-defense. But in order to prove that argument, you first to establish the criteria when we consider something to be a legitimate act of self-defense or not. This is needed as a metric of sorts, because when you move to the second step, 
which is the link of the principle and the motion. So explaining why the motion fulfills or doesn't fulfill the principle, you need to be able to measure against something. So this motion fulfills the principle of self-defense because it meets the criteria for self-defense. Or if you want to claim you know, democratic agency and you, need to, and you want to claim that people need to have a certain level of agency within their country, this motion fulfills that principle because it brings us closer to achieving that criteria and so on and so forth. So how does the motion fulfill or doesn't fulfill a principle? Comes after defining the principle and comes after defining the criteria by which we measure that principle. The next step, very obviously, is that you want to explain the importance of the principle. So in other words, why does it matter so much? Why do we care? Because you can run a principle and you can prove a principle well, but if you cannot convince the judges that they should care about this principle, or they should care about it more than they care about other arguments, it's not likely to win in the debate. I'm going to try to give you a couple of uh, pieces of advice in terms of how, you know, some kind of tricks that you can use in order to make your principles sound better and sound more important. The first thing which is very useful is that it helps to connect your principles to broad ideas that everyone agrees with. So to try to portray your principle as being a self-evident thing, a self-evident you know, benefit that nobody can disagree with. What, but to give an example, what I very often like to do is I, I like to equate the right to choice, the right to free choice, to the right to life and say that one is tantamount to the other. The analysis I use behind it is to say, the only way for people to have a fulfilled and dignified life is for them to be able to fulfill their preferences or at least to be able to try to fulfill their preferences. So what defines a person's life as dignified or as a good life is incredibly subjective. We all have our own definitions of the good life. What makes our single life good or bad then depends on how well we are able to follow our subjective preferences. If we are denied the ability to follow our subjective preferences, then we are denied the ability to achieve our definition of happiness, therefore denied the ability to pursue a dignified life. Therefore, the right to free choice is equal to the right to life insofar as the ability to choose to follow our own preferences is what makes a dignified life in the first place. To give an example of how this is used in a debate, I very often like to use this in conjunction with the state power principle. So the state power principle, at least the way I like to do it, is to say the following. There are three reasons why there's a disproportionate amount of power that the state has over an individual citizen. The first is that every single aspect of your life is determined by state policy and legislation. So be it education, be it healthcare, be it welfare, be it wage and labor policies. The second is that the state has an overwhelming amount of coercive power to force you to do its bidding, even if you do not want to do so. So the state has the court system, which can put you in prison. The state has the police and the military, which we can use actual firepower to enforce their decisions. And it's practically impossible for you as an individual citizen to resist the power of the state. So not only does the state have the absolute control over life through policy, it also gives you very few mechanisms to oppose the state, at least violently. And thirdly, it's hard to avoid, it's impossible to avoid being in a state. You functioning cannot be stateless. You can move between states, but even so far as the world is made up of states, you can never be stateless. And even if you could be stateless, you would not have human rights outside of a state because you have human rights only to the extent to which the state provides them for you. Therefore, the only way for people to control their destiny and to control the material conditions of their existence is to control the state. Because if the state subsumes every element of a human life and the state controls your life to the fullest extent, then the only way for you to take control of your life is to take control of the state. And this is an argument you would use in debates about voting and democracy. So in debates like this house would give more votes to the poor or this house would give more votes to minorities or things like that. And then here's how the right to life, right to choice thing comes in. If you're, for example, saying talking about voting, so claiming, for example, that poor individuals need to have more votes because they are more disprivileged within democracy and everyone should have the right to control their destiny through the state. Given that the state controls every single aspect of your life, and therefore the only way for you to follow your preferences and to control anything in your life is to control the state, being able to have the right of choice 
in a democracy, the right of choice of government, the right of influence over who the government is, is equal to the right to life. Because if you do not have the ability to choose who governs you, you have absolutely no ability to control your life. Therefore, you cannot pursue your definition of a dignified life, which means that you have lost the right to a dignified life. Therefore, the right to choice within a country is identical to the right to a dignified life. The reason why this is important is because the right to a dignified life is something that everyone considers to be the absolute pinnacle of rights. This is something that every human being is accorded and every human being should have this respected. And if you are able to equate, let's say, lower tier principles with higher tier principles that people are unlikely to disagree with, your principles immediately become more persuasive. I think just another addition to this is to be careful about how you name your principles. So don't, so instead of saying something is unfair, say that something is a fundamental injustice. Or instead of saying that this denies people the ability to choose, it denies them agency. Now, this may seem like, you know, just rhetorical bullshit, but this is something that makes arguments more persuasive subconsciously to judges. And it is somewhat an EPL ESL bias thing. Because if someone hears, we're going to prove that this is unfair, that kind of sounds, you know, not as serious as something being a injustice to human dignity or something like that. And just given that people like rhetorics and persuasive rhetorics make people listen more and debate judges are not, you know, impervious to this, it just helps to use words and use phrasing that uh, that actually sounds more persuasive and that sounds more powerful. The second, and I think very important piece of advice in terms of crafting a persuasive principle is the usage of analogies. Analogies help make the principle self-evident. Analogies meaning means finding an idea that seems common sense and everyone intuitively agrees with it and analogizing it with the principle that you are running, which can be used both offensively and defensively. I'm going to give a couple of examples. The first one, let's say uh, that the debate is, this house would allow members of religious communities to democratically elect their leaders. Nobody would probably disagree with the idea of democracy in general uh, and the idea of people getting to choose their government. And we can use the state power principle to prove this. So let's go through the criteria why we think that people need to have power to choose in a democracy. I already explained them, so I'll be very short. The first one is the state decides every aspect of your life. This is true and even more true for religious leaders because not only do they give you rules that you need to follow in your everyday life, so they interpret the Bible or the Quran or the Talmud and they you know, give you applications of this in real life, you need to follow things, like you need to fast or not eat particular things, you need to pray, a certain amount of times a day, but they also control your afterlife because they are your guides to the afterlife. And if you believe in the afterlife, for you, the afterlife is as good as real. So they don't just control your earthly life, they also control your other life. The second criterion, the state has coercive power uh, to force you to do its bidding. The same is true of religious leaders because they, being the ones with the largest amount of authority to interpret scripture, can impose upon you the threat of religious damnation, which is to say that given that there are, you know, instruments like, for example, confession, uh, confession in, in, you know, Catholicism and the priest can give you penance, for example, this is a way for them to get you to do their bidding, which is to say, they can say, if you don't do this by my religious authority to interpret scripture, I say that you are treading down the path of sin. So they have coercive power over you. Third criterion, you cannot fundamentally be stateless because you cannot escape the state. If you believe in the afterlife and if you believe in God, you can never escape God because God is omnipresent and, om and, and omniscient, which means that real given that this is unescapable and there exists an afterlife, you need to have the right to choose who guides you to that afterlife. Here is why this analogy works. Because what you can then say is, if the other side agrees on these three criteria that people should have the right to choose within a state, then they also have to agree that people should have the right to choose the religious leaders because the three criteria work even better for religious leaders. And this forces the opposition to either disagree with both of these things and explain why actually they don't like democracy and they don't think people have the right to choose, or they have to explain why your analogy is not analogous, both of which give them additional work. Second example, and this is an offensive example, and this is an example that we use uh, in, in, uh, in a debate about cancel culture where uh, the team that supported cancel culture on a principle, which in essence uh, talked about 
personal harm and the right to avoid personal harm. So they said, insofar, certain individuals say statements or have types of behavior which are offensive to other individuals, these individuals have the right to retaliate against that offense by providing the measure of cancel. The analogy that we gave was the following. If we were to imagine, for example, an LGBTQ rights activist in an incredibly conservative religious community, this, this person's actions not only offend the surrounding community, but insofar as they are religious, make the surrounding community, or at least the very orthodox members of that community, believe that they are in the presence of a truly sinful person, a person whose behavior perhaps endangers the metaphysical fate of the entire community. By the extension of the principle of the government, they would have to support canceling that kind of person. Here is the thing, nobody in their right mind would say we should cancel an LGBTQ rights activist in in a conservative community. But the consequence of their principle is exactly that, which means that they either have to prove why they would not do this and put, make, their principle incon make their principle inconsistent, or they, would, or they would have to explain why they would cancel both, which is not a particularly good thing to do in this kind of type of situation. Another rebuttal that was good in that situation was to argue for proportionality. This is just in terms of rebutting principles. What we argue is yes, even if people do have the right to retaliate, retaliation needs to be proportional. Here is why canceling someone and taking away their entire livelihood is not proportional to the harm that was done to you based on them you know, making a tweet which was offensive or something like this. And this ties into what I said earlier, the definition of the, definition of the principle, because they said, People have the right to retaliate. We said, yes, but there needs to be certain criteria for this retaliation to be legitimate. Here is why you go beyond that criteria. So it's giving an example of what I said earlier. Third analogy, and I think this is, you know, maybe the, 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 the most, you know, metaphysical one. So you, the fat man analogy in the, in, in the trolley problem, it's called the fat man analogy, apparently, which you, everyone knows the trolley problem. So you find yourself in a situation where you are in a trolley, and uh, the trolley is currently on a track to kill five people, but if you pull a lever, you can knowingly decide to kill one person instead of five. Would you do this or would you not? And the argument that's usually used for pulling the lever and killing one person is the argument that says, in both situations, you are making a knowing decision to kill someone or not kill someone. It's better to kill a smaller amount of people. The fat man analogy then says, Okay, let's say that you're a bystander on a bridge and you are observing the trolley problem. And there is a fat man also on the bridge who you can push off the bridge to stop the trolley. And if, if you push the fat man off the bridge, the trolley is going to be stopped and neither the five people on the left or the one person right is going to be killed. Would you push the fat man as a bystander? People have very, uh, very hard time defending this analogy because it seems unintuitive. Because the trolley problem is a thought experiment and we all heard of it, we're all invested in it. But when an analogy takes the, you out of the trolley problem and says, oh look, you're just a guy on a bridge and you can push another innocent guy onto a railroad track, this seems horrible to everyone. And it makes it hard for teams to argue, to continue arguing for their argument. So the thing is, find something that everyone is going to agree with, that everyone is going to consider common sense and analogize it to the situation. Of course, you need to explain why your analogy is analogous. And secondly, you need to strategically utilize it in a speech. What does this mean? You need to explicitly say what the analogy does for the burden. So in the, uh, let's say for LGBTQ rights activist example I gave, you need to explicitly say in your speech, this means that either the government needs to stand for counseling individuals who campaign for human rights just because this offends someone, or in order to keep their principle consistent, they would have to explain why this is not analogous and why their principle doesn't necessitate this. But this needs to be said explicitly. You need to give the implication of your analogy for the burden very, ex very explicitly within, within the round. Let's see, there are questions in the chat. I will read out the question, uh, although it's visible for everyone. Question number one, when going to principally defend democracy, how can I know that democratic leadership doesn't have as much coercive power as other forms of political structures? Since it's vague to understand if there's any stark difference between political structure and coercive power, even if you have freedom of expression in democracy, does it give justification for democracy? 
Second, a recent report on how satisfied this young generation was, and the result was unfortunate that youth were dissatisfied. So the status quo, young veering against the off against democracy. How can you defend a democratic system on a principle ground? I think, first of all, the answer to the first part is comparative. So obviously, democratic systems can also be coercive. And they are coercive to the extent to which any state is necessarily is necessarily a coercive, coercive institution or group of institutions. Um, what does uh, what does this mean? This means that comparatively, if your criteria is um, if your criteria is how much people have the right to control their lives, they have more of it in democracy than they do in the comparative system. And second, the response would be to say that. In situations where democracies are not as, you know, allowing of people's freedoms and rights as they should be, this is solved by more democracy and not less democracy. I think in terms of the second thing of the young veering off against democracy, I, I, I think the response to this is to say, in order for the young to be able to express their preferences against democracy and to see them implemented into the political system, they require democracy in the first place. Because people can dislike democracy, but in order for them to be able to choose for themselves that they dislike democracy, and in order for them to abolish democracy or you know vote in a party that doesn't like democracy without having to put their lives at risk through a violent revolution, they first need democracy. We need that democracy is prior to any kind of preference expression, especially if people do abolish democracy and they you know implement a dictatorship. They can also be dissatisfied with that dictatorship. So if someone is arguing and saying, but people are dissatisfied with democracy, the answer can be, but they can also be dissatisfied with what comes after democracy. For them to be able to change that, they will need to have a democratic system. They will need to have the ability to control and choose the state. The uh, second, other question is, what is the criteria for a state's policy to be justified versus coercive, like making education mandatory or forcing us to follow laws? I think this is largely the harm principle. I think the justification here is that the amount of restriction imposed by the state should be proportional to the amount of benefit received or the harm prevented. I.e., the, the, state the state's restrictions are justified insofar as they provide more benefit than they do harm. And this is, I think, the usage of utilitarianism as a principle, because all state decisions are coercive. There is no law that's not coercive. So the question then is, how do we determine whether laws are acceptable or unacceptable? We determine them based on the outcomes of these laws, whether we think that the coercion is something that we're willing to accept for the outcome of that law. Uh, next question is, how can we use analogies or heuristics when we are running a non-rhetorical principle? Example, principle of specialization and free trade is a theoretical principle that fulfills the criteria of a principle seeking to maximize consumption, but it's perhaps not as intuitive as democracy and moral reciprocity. I mean, I think it depends on the type of principle you are running. I think, for example, if you're running, you know, generally a principle of free trade, I think what you can say is, in general, there is nothing that people inherently owe to other individuals. So the fact that I possess a skill does not necessarily mean that I owe it to society to provide that skill to them. So for example, I can be skilled at mathematics. It would be nice of me to teach people mathematics for free. There is no moral obligation for me to do that. Insofar as that is true, people should be able to use and market their skills through free trade and to allow them and to be allowed to you know, set a price for their skills and other people should be allowed to decide whether or not they want to buy these skills or they want to buy these products. And it's maybe an analogy I would use in general, but I think just very much depends on, very much depends on how much and how much you know, uh, the principle is specific and in what, in what kind of motion you're running the principle and so on and so forth. Uh, okay. Moving onwards, uh, I think, however, what needs to be kept in mind is that analogies are not enough, as not everyone will always have your intuitions. So you need analytical reasoning as well. You need to have theoretical analysis, theoretical reasoning as to why something should be true. And I think very often this can be done in you know, common sense ways. So for example, if you're arguing for agency, what you can say is, look, uh, given that there is no objectively you know, good path, uh, good path to happiness. So there is no universal definition of happiness. People are the ones who are best able to determine what happiness is for themselves. We think that insofar as happiness is what makes people's lives, lives worthwhile, people should have agency to make their lives happy. This is, you know, quite a, quite a common sense statement. If they don't have agency, they're unable to pursue happiness, 
and stuff like this. I think this is also just a generally good way uh, to weigh off utility versus agency because there is no objective way to determine utility. So utility is a subjective calculation of preferences, which means that what constitutes utility for an individual person is a consequence of, a, uh, of the collection of their experiences, of their desires, and of their emotions. Every individual has a different set of those, which means that when that, there is no objective way to determine utility. This therefore means that the only thing we can defer to is allowing individuals to choose for themselves what utility means to them. This means that agency is prior to utility because in order for utility to exist, every individual person first needs to have agency to determine what utility is for themselves because, because there is no objective way to determine it. But secondly, uh, this, this therefore means that utility doesn't exist if agency is not allowed. So we should therefore prioritize agency over utility. I think just a good example, good intuition for this is to say, we could assume that uh, saying the word dog would, give, would uh, give most people positive utility because you know dogs make people happy. But if you know somebody's dog has recently passed away, then they can be very sad if someone says the word dog in their presence. So we can never assume what's going to bring people utility. Only people can do this for themselves. Therefore, agency is coming prior for utility. So in general, do not spend too much time on analogies. Because if your analogy takes four minutes to explain, then it's probably very unclear and convoluted. And secondly, as I've said, not everyone will have your intuitions. You need to have theoretical reasoning. It generally just you know, comes down to answering a common question of why this matters. If you're having trouble answering the question of why something matters, I think that a good way to bypass this and to come up with you know, intuitive reasons as to why a principle is important is to imagine a world without a certain principle and then try to see why that world is worse. So if you were to have a world without freedom of choice, why is that a worse world? If we were to have a world where our agency was reduced in a particular way, why would that be a worse world? And then from this, you can extract why conversely, it would be a better world if we were not, if we were not denied that agency and if we were not denied a certain amount of freedom of choice. So, and this is similar to the general technique of if you don't know how to argue for something, then you're gonna, and, and so for example, if you, you know, you're opening government on a motion and you, and only opening opposition seems intuitive to you. So don't know what the OG case is. You can always start by doing at least rebuttal to the OO case that you know. This is similar to this. Imagine an alternative world where, it, where this principle doesn't exist. Try to find reasons why it's bad. There is a question, does a principle necessarily need a theoretical framework or is it possible to just base it all on tangible impacts in order to prove why it's important? Um, I mean, you can run a principle with utilitarian elements. The thing is that then very often, it, the, the risk behind this is that it's then uh, tied to practical impacts. So if you're running, so if you're basing your principle on tangible impacts, you also need to prove that these impacts are true. Because if the impacts are not true, then also your principle doesn't hold true because based on what you asked, for the principle to hold true, you need to prove certain impacts. And I think this disarms one of the strongest strengths that princi principles have, which they're independent of practical outcomes. Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about in weighing uh, principle, which is also the last step, need to weigh the principle. Just before that, I'm gonna take 20 seconds. I need to uh, relatively urgently respond to a message, I'm sorry. Yeah, cool. Uh, before moving on to weighing, question is, how do you manage which principles to prioritize and argue them in a way that responds to your opponent's case? Uh, and this is a question that doesn't have a clear answer uh, insofar as there are different debates and different principles that you can run. I think just a template question that you can ask yourself is, for any argument, so not just a principle, is if the judge, if I explain this and the judge believes this, so let's say the judge buys this argument 100%, how does this argument help me win? which means that if the answer to the question is, even if we prove this principle, it doesn't bring us you know, that close to victory, maybe there's another principle we should run or maybe we shouldn't run principles in this motion. So maybe the question of, if the judge completely believes this, 
how close does it bring me to victory and why does it help me win could be a question which in prep could help you determine what or what not to run. Question is on utilitarianism and consequentialism. If we are using the analysis of how the world would be worse without a principle, aren't we just using consequentialist logic to weigh principles? How is then it independent of outcomes or impacts? Uh, I'm not sure it's fully consequentialist. I mean, this is similar to the, uh, to the Kantian categorical principle. So the categorical principle uh, provided by Immanuel Kant is fully deontological. So it, so it doesn't rely on outcomes. It says that certain things are just unjust. The way he uses, uh, the, the mechanism he uses to check whether things are unjust is to say, imagine if all people were to do something, how would the world look? Because the reason why we value principles and why we consider principles to be values, the reason why we use the word value is because we think they add some kind of value to our lives, i.e. the introduction of a certain principle in the end provides value, which means that to some extent, we need to argue about the importance of the existence of a principle within, within our lives. Uh, I mean, I think you could make the case that all principles are consequentialist in the end, insofar as the end goal of every principle and having states protect them is to bring, you know, more dignity and happiness to people. And if you consider dignity and happiness to be, you know, consequentialist things, then maybe you could make the case that all principles are consequentialist. But I think just using the idea of uh, checking whether your principle is actually a good principle or not by an imagined alternative world still works because you need to find a reason why, for example, freedom of speech is important. And this is tied to the idea that freedom of speech brings some value to people and brings some benefits to individuals. So therefore, I think this still works. I am going to talk about this a little bit more in, in weighing principles and what specifically I mean by them being independent of outcomes or impacts. Uh, okay. In terms of weighing principles, there are a there are a number there are a number of ways to weigh principles. The first one is weighing on independence for practical outcomes, and I think this is uh, also then the answer to the question that was asked. Someone, what does this mean? This means that regardless of who wins the practical clash, the principle will remain true. Let's give an example of this. If we take the motion, this house would give more votes to the poor. Opening government will, let's say, argue that this means that the poor have more leverage over the state, and therefore that the state is going to care more about poor people. Opening opposition will then say, uh, here are a number of reasons why the poor actually are not going to vote because they're too apathetic, they distrust the political system, opening government is not going to get their impacts. What closing government can win on is saying, we think there's an obligation of the state to provide poor people with the chance to have more recourse towards the state. And then you can argue on things like, the poor are the most disprivileged within the state, the poor are the people who the state has failed the most. In a state, everyone should have equal recourse towards that state. The poor currently have less of it because even though they have one vote like everyone else, they have less money, they have less political capital, we need to equalize the playing field. All these are reasons why the state owes it to poor people to give them this chance. Regardless of whether they are going to use this chance, even if they don't go to the ballot box, if they choose not to go to the ballot box and opening government has no impact, closing government still proves that the state has an obligation to provide this to them, even if they don't use it. And I think even in this case, so this is fully independent of the practical clash. So regardless of whether OG proves that poor people will vote or all proves that they won't vote, closing government has independently of this proven that insofar as the motion is normative and it says this house would give or this house, you know, believe that the poor should have more votes. Closing government has proven that this is something that should be done, therefore successfully propose the motion without actually arguing for an impact. Now to connect this to the idea of using an alternative world as a checking mechanism. I can still say, let's imagine a world where a state does not give poor individuals the chance to have equal recourse to everyone else. This is a worse world. This is a worse world because a certain amount of people who are already the most disprivileged, do not have recourse to control their lives. And a world where a certain amount of people who are also probably the most unhappy people in society are not able to change their circumstances and are forced to you know, live in poverty because they can't control the state is a worse world. This doesn't change the fact that the argument I've made is independent of practical outcomes in that debate. Because I've made an argument 
which proves an obligation, regardless of whether OG or OO win the practical clash. But I can still use the alternative world mechanism to say a world where the state doesn't do this is a worse world because we believe in the value of people being able to control the material conditions of their existence. So philosophically, you could make a case that this is utilitarian in the end. Because why should they control their existence? Because this leads to happiness, happiness is utility. Fine, but this doesn't change the fact that within the scope of the debate, the argument I've made is still independent of the practical clash. So this is how I think the independence of practical outcomes can coexist with the idea of using counterfactuals as checking mechanisms. Because you just need to prove that the principle is independent of teams winning the practical clash in the rounds. This is the way in which you weigh the principle. And I think when you do this, you can use motion phrasing to your advantage. Because most motions are phrased normative. So this house believes that we should do something or this house supports something, this house <coughs> prefers something. This means that these emotions do not inherently require you to prove utility. They require you to prove that there is something that should be done. Something should be done regardless of whether or not it provides utility. Or at least you can prove that this is true. There are things which we can claim that humans should do even if the overall sum of utility is not going to be a positive sum of utility. So for example, we can say that people should not assault other individuals, even if there is theoretically no conceivable harm. So the analogy that was used, and I think this, is, this was uh, Ashish Kumar's uh, analogy, which is very good, which is uh, technically, let's imagine a case of harmless assault. In what way? So there was an assault of whatever type, and the victim doesn't remember the assault. So they have no psychological uh, memory or psychological trauma or impact. There was no damage to the victim. Somehow the body was not damaged in any way. So the victim has no negative utility from that assault. We can still say that people should not assault other people, even if we can imagine a case where technically there is no negative utility. So saying that something should happen doesn't imply utility. You can argue for it, but it's not implied in the motion. So what you can do is you can explicitly say in debate, and this is what I like to do, this motion is phrased as a normative claim. Insofar as it's phrased as a normative claim, the burden of teams in this debate is to prove that this is normatively acceptable. And therefore, by proving the principle, we have already proven our burden because we have proven the normative logic behind. I think this is the way which you can use motion phrasing to your advantage, which I think goes well in conjunction with weighing on independence from practical outcomes, which is to say when you weigh independently practical outcomes, what you're going to say is, panel, regardless of who wins the practical clash, our principle remains true regardless, which is why we are, let's say if you're from closing, you're we are independent of the opening half. Therefore, we are logically prior to anything that the opening half is arguing. The second uh, uh, mechanism to weigh principles is weighing on universality. Uh, what does this mean? This means that principles are true in all instances, whereas practical arguments are always only true in a certain, even a high percentage. For example, if OG helps 80% of people through a particular motion, but CG shows that there is an obligation towards 100% of people to implement that motion, then CG wins on universality because CG shows that in 100% of cases, a principle applies. Whereas practical impacts will always happen only in a percentage of cases. Any motion, whatever, you know, whatever motion it is, is not going to help everyone and it's going to harm someone. So there is never a 100% practical benefit. A well-proven principle is a universal principle. It applies in all cases. And this is, again, a good, ex a good example is, again, the, the, the voting for the poor thing, which uh, more votes for the poor. Even if we don't help all of the poor, even if we don't help most of the poor, it is true that the state has an obligation towards every single poor person, whether or not they are helped, which means that the principle is true in more cases than the practical is true, which means that on quantity of cases to which the argument applies, the principle applies to a larger amount of cases and is truer in more cases. And this is the way in which you can weigh it off. And I think in this case, you also can win on engagement. Because let's, if, if we take the example of 
OG helps 80% of people, but CG proves we have an obligation towards 100% of people, even if they're not helped. Uh, CG can win on engagement with OO as well, because CG proves that we should do this, even if not all people are helped, which is likely to be part of the opposition case. So weighing on universality is something that is also a good way to, 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 to weigh our principles. So weighing on independence and weighing on universality, I think are the two most common ways to weigh principles and the ones that most often work. What you need to keep in mind is that running a principle is a high burden. There is bias towards consequentialism in general, because the number one, I will say this explicitly, there are just a number of people who don't understand principles. Secondly, it's easier to judge in a round on the same metric that all teams run on, because most teams, most of the time will run consequentialist cases. And then you have one team who runs the principle and it's hard you know, to compare a principle to three consequentialist cases. And it's just the easy way out to judge based on the common metric in the round, which is consequentialism. And principles are hard to weigh against practical claims for judges just as they are for speakers, which means that you need to be aware that you should run a principle if you are sure about it, not just because it sounds fun. So this is not an argument against running principles, but this is just to say, be careful when you are running principles and be sure that you know how to explain a principle well. Just keep in mind that the bias against principles exists and that you need to be relatively sure of what you're running, and that it's going to be run well, when you decide to run. Uh, another thing to remember is that principles very often have to be weighed against each other. So let's say one team runs one principle, the other team runs another. So how do you weigh principles against each other? I think the easiest way to do this is through contingency or through logical priority, which is to say that one principle is a prerequisite for another principle. Uh, I think a good example of this is, uh, so my idea of uh, the right to choice and the right to life is actually that. So the right to choice is actually a prerequisite for the right to life. I think another good example is security versus freedom, where, for example, if you have debates about uh, you know, restrictions being imposed on people uh, uh, to, to you know, uh, pre prevent certain harms, for example, if you have, you know, we're trying to prevent terrorism, and then when states implement, you know, let's say, CCTV surveillance, and this to some extent harms people's freedom to privacy. Then you can, and then a way you can do is here's why security is more important. First of all, because if you are dead, you cannot exercise any other right. So security as a principle comes before any other principle because you first need to be alive to exercise another principle. Secondly, because security, or at least the feeling of security, is a prerequisite for me to actually feel free. So for example, if I think that when I go onto the street, a terrorist is going to attack me. I am not free to go onto the street. I mean, objectively I am. There is no law or physical force stopping me. But if I believe that I'm going to be attacked on the street, I will not feel free to go out on the street because I will think I'm going to get attacked. I'm going to be scared if I go out on the street or I will lock myself into my house. So even though I objectively have freedom, I functionally don't have freedom because I don't feel free and therefore I behave in an unfree manner, which means that it, as a prerequisite, for me to be free, I have to believe that I am safe. So regardless of whether or not there actually is a terrorist waiting to kill me, if I think that he's there, I'm going to behave accordingly. So in order for the principle of freedom to be fulfilled, we first need to prioritize security because only when people are safe can they fully exercise freedom. So most often you're going to weigh on principles being contingent on one another or prior to one another. And just keep in mind in general that principles will have to be weighed against each other, especially in fully principled debates. Such debates exist and you will have to weigh principles against principles. Moving on to the part of how to strategically utilize principles and how to defend your principles. First of all, just combine them with practical arguments. Uh, there are motions that are exclusively principled, but they are relatively rare. And running an exclusively principled case is very often a very risky strategy for the reasons I've explained earlier in terms of consequentialist bias, but also because if you choose to run a fully principled case, in a motion that has a practical element as well, you will have to do a lot of washing out of the practical and proving that the practical is uncomparative. And very often this is hard because it's hard to prove that something is fully uncomparative. So you can show that it's marginally comparative, but most things are comparative to some extent. So there's a high burden in running an exclusively principal case. So you want to combine them with practical arguments. And this is the strategically best thing to do because ideally you want multiple avenues for victory. Because if you run a principal argument and a practical argument, you can say, okay, 
Our principle is independent of the practical and has already won this debate. But even if you don't buy this panel, we will also win the practical clash. So even if they don't buy your first attempt at victory, you have a second independent attempt at victory, which they can still buy. So in any debate, then this is not, not just true of principle arguments, it's true of case building techniques and case building strategy in general. You want to have different avenues for victory, which are not dependent on one another. So if you have one argument, which a judge doesn't buy, you want to have a second argument, which is independent of the first one, which they can still buy and can still make you win. So combine them. Second thing is you will want to explicitly call out principle biases. So you will want to say things like, I know this sounds abstract and metaphysical, but I've given you weighing and proof why this wins over practical arguments. We, we hope that the principle is going to be weighed fairly within this debate. So call out implicit biases in judges. Tell them, we know that this is an abstract argument, but utility is not the only thing that's worth in debates. Other teams need to engage with our principle, and if they don't, we win. So call this out explicitly. Call out other teams on engaging, and call out the judges on weighing this, because nobody wants to be explicitly biased. I don't think anyone you know, explicitly says, I hate principles, and I will now cross out the principle on my, my flowchart, but they are implicitly biased against principles. So if you call out these implicit biases, you bring it to the judge's consciousness that they may be biased and nobody wants to think of themselves as biased, but also they know that they have a panel. And if a team in the round has expressed a concern that there may be an anti-principle bias, the judge will know that their panelists will also be wary of this and they don't want their panelists to give them bad feedback. So this is uh, something that you can do. And this is not just true of principle bias. You can do this for ESL bias, for sexist bias, all of these. Thirdly, I would just advise against running principles in actor motions. And even though the judge manual says that you can run principle arguments in actor motions, the judge manual also adds that in order to run a principle argument in an actor motion, you need to prove why it is in the interest or the incentive of the actor to fulfill a principle. This is necessarily not a principled argument because you are saying because the actor believes in this principle, they would get utility or happiness or fulfillment or moral joy for following a principle. So you are arguing that it is in the utilitarian benefit of the actor to follow a principle because they believe in that principle. So you're not saying this is a principle obligation or this is a principle which holds true. You are saying an actor believes in something, therefore from their perspective, it's good to follow a principle. Which means therefore that this is not a principled argument. So I would advise instead of, instead of running principle arguments in actor motions, just if you want to say an actor has a moral compass, they should follow this because it's going to bring them happiness, you can run it, but don't frame it as a principle because I don't think you actually can run a principle in actor debate. Question in the chat, what if all other three teams have made practical arguments and a CEO you make a principle case? Is it a strategy to avoid or what can be done to still win? I mean, in general, that depends on the debate and how well they run the practical, it's possible to win. So if you're able to show that most of the practical arguments are marginally comparative, and then prove that your principle is actually true, you can win. If you weigh very well on the examples I gave you on independence for practical outcomes and universality, you can win. You can also just run the principle and something practical and you can win. But this depends on the debate at hand and this depends on how well other teams are running their arguments and how well you can run your principle. This is just a very you know, context specific question that I'm not sure I can answer, uh, that I can answer very specifically. Um, so, in terms of defending principles, I think there are three things I would want to say. First of all, you can you have to remind yourself that principles are seen as binary. So they are other, either proven or they are unproven. What does this mean? This means that there needs to be a response to the, to the principle uh, from the other teams. First of all, call out other teams if they are not responding to your principle. But secondly, you need to respond to challenges to your principle. Because the strength of principle art, is, which is that they are either universally true or untrue, which you can use in a way, is also the weakness of principle arguments, which means that they are either proven or they are unproven. So if there is a challenge to your principle, you definitely need to respond to it. Secondly, people will often fail to respond or they will fail to respond fuller. They will try to straw man your principle, point out those straw mans. And thirdly, remember specificity. Because very often, well, the way people are going to attack your principle is they're going to say, but why this principle in particular? 
Or why is this motion the particular way to fulfill a principle? So remember preemptively that you need to explain why a motion is the unique, or if not unique, then at least the best way to fulfill a particular principle. A good example of this is the, I think it's the test world quarterfinal where there was the idea of uh, creating an African-American uh, state in the United States of America and Boseo and Panelli run this case from OG and they argued for specificity preemptively. So they say this particular policy of giving them a state is necessary because this is the only way to have proportional reparations because African-Americans were depatriated they were taken away from their countries. So their homeland was taken away from them. But the only proportional reparation is for us to give them a homeland or a country. So preemptively argue for specificity. And this is true of arguments in general. So not just for principles. You need to prove why a motion is a unique or if not a unique, then at least the best way to fulfill a particular principle or to solve a particular problem if you're arguing for a practical argument. So unique or if not unique, then at least the best because otherwise, there is a very, very easy way for other teams to just come and say, yeah, sure, but there are other ways to do this which are just better. So keep this in mind. In terms of dealing with principles, in i.e. I. how to attack principles, the first thing is you can try to portray principles as being contingent on practicalities, i.e. practicalities being just logically prior for a principle to work. So this is the idea of, let's say, <clears throat> a government argues for agency, and then you just say, yeah, sure, but for agency to be fulfilled, there need to be these three practical impacts which first need to happen, which means that their case is contingent on the practical. So again, using the example of this house would give the poor more votes, OG runs a principle of this is going to increase agency for the poor. You can say this is not a principle because in order for this to actually increase agency for the poor, you need the poor to vote. So you first need to prove that they're going to go to the ballot box for this to bring more agency. It means that very often you can call out principles <clears throat> on being contingent on practicalities or on actually being practical argument. And this is a way to weigh against principles as well. For example, if you are closing and you're opening grounds of principle, if you can show that for the principle to be true, there first need to be some practical mechanisms which are proven, you can weigh by saying, we are actually the ones who provide the analysis to why the principle is true, making it contingent on the practical, and we are the ones who provided those practicalities. The second thing is you can win principle clashes by using practicality. For example, you can portray utility as being a principle value because utilitarianism in a way is also a principle. So what you can say, for example, is if all preferences are subjective and therefore utility matters insofar as it enables people to fulfill those preferences. And also we should defer therefore to people's subjective definitions of pain and pleasure. What we are actually doing is we are arguing for utility. We are arguing for the largest amount of people to be able to access the largest amount of utility. In another, another good thing to say, another good logic here is say the following. Given that there is no way for us to measure pleasure and pain objectively, and this is, I think, the example when I said, ah, when I say dog, some people will be happy, some people will be unhappy. The only thing we can defer to is pain and pleasure and their maximization or minimization because this is all that people experience. So all experiences that people have can be subsumed under pleasure and pain. We cannot make a calculus in terms of the value of two different moral actors. So each person is an equally valuable moral actor. So their pain and pleasure is equally valuable. Given we cannot uh, objectively measure pain and pleasure, the only thing we can defer to is just maximizing the largest amount of pleasure for the largest amount of individuals. I.e., you can turn the argument off the, the argument of agency, which is to say people's preferences are subjective, therefore we prioritize agency over utility, you can turn that argument on its head and say that the fact that the preferences are subjective is actually an argument for utility. To give you an example, in the Cambridge IV quarterfinal in uh, 2018, there was the motion of this house would rather see uh, 100 innocent men go to jail than one guilty person walk free. The argument for the argument for utilitarianism in this debate is to say, given that we cannot make a, 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 a you know moral calculus between two moral actors, there is no way to determine that one human being is more valuable than another human being. We should prioritize the side where a smaller amount of innocent people are hurt. 
So if you have one innocent man going to jail and a hundred guilty people walking free, we can agree that this one innocent guy should not go to jail. But we can also agree that we should not put people at risk of criminals walking the streets, given that we cannot make a objective calculus of which human being as a moral actor is more valuable, we should prioritize the side which saves the largest amount of moral actors. And therefore, because we cannot have objective definitions of value, because every person is a subjective and equally valuable moral actor, we should defer to saving the largest amount of subjective agencies, because this is the only thing that we can actually defer to lacking any other kind of objective criteria. Thirdly, it's very important to keep in mind to disarm people's analogies. Uh, so for example, if, you, if they use the analogy of the harmless assault that I mentioned earlier, you can say, sure, the analogy works as a thought experiment, but there is no such thing as a harmless assault. The fact that I can you know, strain my mind to imagine this as a thought experiment doesn't mean that this can actually happen. We determine principles and values based on real life circumstances. You cannot base a principle on an analogy which is never going to happen in the real world. So keep in mind, analogies can be flawed. And lastly, keep an eye out for one, lack of importance analysis, people not explaining why their principle is important. And secondly, for lack of weighing, because people will very often fail to weigh their principles and you need to point this out in your speeches. So this is also a good way to deal with principles. There are, there are questions uh, in the chat. So the first one is, in the poor votes debate, the earlier principle you mentioned from CG was that obligation exists. Why is agency of OG then dependent on people going to ballot boxes? I mean, people could have chosen not to exercise the agency, but that doesn't mean they don't have it. So O doesn't feel defeat OG's principle. Uh, depends on how OG makes the principle. So if OG uh, makes the principle as obligation of the state to provide poor people with agency, then no, O, o doesn't be that argument. If OG makes the argument as, this is going to give poor people more agency, and this agency is important because they will then be able to control the state, this would be a principle that's contingent on the practical. Because the second part, the conclusion, is they would then be able to control the state. If they don't exercise that control, then the reason why the agency is important, so if OG says it, it's important for them to be able to control the state, if they don't exercise it, then the reason why OG said it's important is not proven without the practical, and O could defeat the principle. So depending on how well the principle is proven, it's either beaten or unbeaten. I purposefully made the worst version of that argument, to show an example of an argument where teams actually include practical contingency in the principle. The second question is, if we say everyone is an equal moral actor, why does weighing on vulnerability work? I think in fact, the way, weighing that everyone is an equal moral actor actually helps the, the idea of vulnerability. Because we say everyone equally deserves a certain level of human rights and a certain level of happiness and a certain level of dignity. Because if we believe that everyone is an equal moral actor, then everyone is equally entitled to certain things that we call human rights. If there are groups which are inherently more vulnerable and we are not helping them, then we are preventing them from claiming their status as equal moral actors. Because equal moral actors presumes that everyone should have equal standing in terms of rights being provided to them. The most vulnerable groups are those to whom rights are being provided the least. Providing them with those rights fulfills the idea of everyone being an equal moral actor because we are ensuring that we are equalizing them to other individuals by providing them with more privilege and more rights, therefore enabling them to be equal in terms of rights and provisions of those rights to other people. Lastly, I just want to, uh, I just want to keep, uh, point out a couple of ways in which you can improve on doing your principles. I think first thing is just watching debates and watching them actively. In terms of, so when you see people running a principle argument, write it down. If they are using examples or thought experiments that you don't know of, Google those thought experiments and then read a little bit about them, what the logic is behind them. If you don't understand certain terms they use, because they use complex terminology, Google that terminology and what it means. When you write down those arguments, analyze them. What would you add to the argument? What would you remove from the arguments? You can tailor the arguments to your own preferences. Then watch the next speech. See how the other speaker rebutted the principle. Analyze this. Why was the rebuttal to the principle good or not good? Would you have rebutted it differently? Then, then what the next speech and analyze the defense of the principle and write all of these things down and keep all of your notes in one place because you're allowed to have written material uh, in debates. 
develop a lot of the notes of debates that you've watched and principles that you've written down and attacks and defense of those principles, and then your comment on this, you can easily access it in prep time or during debates. Secondly, you can, you can access a lot of resources that tackle principles and tackle philosophy and all of these things. So there are things like Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which just deals with a lot of these things very well. They have explanations of the vast majority of you know, uh, philosophical concepts and stuff like this. There are YouTube channels like Crash Course Philosophy, which explain things in you know, very simple terms. There are a bunch of debate workshops, just like this one, where people explain how to debate principles or how to debate particular principles. There are a lot of resources you can access. What's important is, again, to take notes and, again, to keep all of those notes in one place, because you want to have a resource base that you can easily draw on during prep time and during debate. And I think this is true, not just for principle arguments, but in general. And lastly, you want to ask judges for targeted feedback. So if you're running a principle, ask them for the principle in particular. How could I have done the principle better? How could I have made the principle win? Particularly if you know judges who are very good at principle arguments. And I mean, you will know this by watching debates. You will know who, who does principles well. So for example, one of the things that I know that does principles very well currently uh, some of the best in Europe is DCD his state. So this is Kevin Hamill and Jack Sinnott. So if they are judging you, for example, you can ask them how to you know, improve on your principles and all of these things. And then again, keep notes from that feedback and you know, reflect on these notes and go through this. This is going to help you improve. Uh, okay, so that's largely it for, for me for this lecture. I hope that it was helpful to everyone. I'll just give like 30 seconds if there are any questions that were not asked during the, the, the session. Uh, hello, uh, I do really have a question. Uh, can I ask it? Yeah. Um, is it really okay to like challenge the utilitarianism or likely to um, make your pre or if since you have said that it's a really hard bird or really high burden for principles. So can you um, can I just make my principal argumentation a linchpin for the practical arguments or the utilitarianism that have been mentioned from the other houses, specifically if you're in closing and uh, you're trying to compare uh, like outweigh your opening? Yeah, I mean, you can. So the only thing is that whenever you're trying to connect the principle to the practical, you're also losing the strength of the principle and being independent of the practical. But of course, that you can make an argument which intertwines practical elements with principal elements. The only thing is be wary of what you're gaining and what you're losing by doing that. But this is possible. But I think the best avenue to victory is, as I said, to combine principle and practical. Be like, okay, here is the first independent practical benefit we give. Then we give a second independent practical benefit. And thirdly, we also give a moral reason why we win. I think this is probably the safest way to go about it. Um, I just... Uh, I, know, I just asked that question because if your opening half is really good and taken down all the, taken out all the practical arguments and you're left with just principles, just like uh, on that scenario, like my question was for. I mean, in that scenario, probably the best way to win with the principle is to try to, one, wash out a lot of the practicalities to explain why a lot of them is either un not fully proven by both teams on top half or why it's likely to end up being a wash, i.e. that not much is going to change and then run the principle. And secondly, to go very hard on weighing the principle in any way that you can imagine, whether it's on universality, on independence or whatever. So first you would have to probably spend a lot of time washing out the practicalities. And then secondly, you would have to weigh the principle really hard against, against the, the top half teams. Because if, as you said, opening government took out all of the practical and then you try to make the principle the linchpin for the practical, it runs the risk of ending up contingent on that same practicality, which OG already ran. So if you have no practical arguments and only the principle, the best thing to do is just go Hail Mary, like full heart on the principle, try to wash out the practical as much as possible and to weigh the principle as hard as possible. Um, just the last question, like um, I've heard from people that uh, washing out your opening might lead to knifing. So how do you avoid like uh, the, the subtle the fine line difference? It's largely a question of phrasing. So you cannot say our opening is wrong when they say this. What you can say is their idea is good and we agree that they have some marginal impact. We don't think the impact is particularly large. What you can say is opening government makes a good case, but opening opposition has a good 
has a good complaint to that case. They raise a good question. And then it's either unclear who is the top half or opening government doesn't respond to opening opposition. So it's unclear whether opening government proves their case. So what you cannot do is you cannot disagree with the opening government case. You can say that they did not prove their case well. So you can attack the amount of proof and the quality of proof that they've given so long as you don't contradict the idea of the case. I'm just going to give it like 15 or 20 more seconds to see if anyone else has anything to ask. Question, can principles also exist independent of existing frames in this debate, or do they necessarily need to conform or challenge these frames? They can exist independently. The thing is, if you run a principle which is outside of the frame of a particular debate, you need to explain why the principle is more important than that frame, i.e. why the debate should not be judged within that frame, but rather based on your principle. But obviously, they can exist independently of existing frames, yeah. Uh, hi, I had a question. So uh, in one of the debates that, or maybe it was a spar that we were doing, uh, this team, what they tried to do was they tried to run like practical arguments in terms of like corruption, it's bad, blah, blah, blah. But like they premise their, each of their arguments on an underlying principle that they didn't really pick up on. For example, corruption is theft, right? Um, this was like evident in this particular debate, but like how do we recognize if some other team is doing it or how do we do it effectively ourselves in terms of just premising the practical with the principle? I mean, in terms of noticing what other teams are doing is just, you know, listening very attentively. Teams will very often, as you said, uh, do this in very vague or simplistic terms of just saying corruption is theft or taxation is theft or whatever. If this is done simplistically, if this is not well explained, you should call them out in the lack of explanation. In terms of how you can do this well, I think this is just a question of you know following the steps that I've given you in terms of crafting a good principle. Because I think the, the a broad question of how can we do a principle argument well, or how we can you know combine principle and practical arguments well, is just a question of how well do you run an argument in a particular motion. I think in terms of following the templates of how to make a good principle and how to weigh a principle well, as you've got that you've got it from this workshop, and as you can also find in other workshops as well. There are a lot of good workshops out there should be something that could help you over time. And then you can ask judges for feedback and see if you have done that successfully.